Out of the Depths by Edward H. Hurlbut. The Stockslager case will be recalled immediately upon the Pacific coast as a crime of some years ago marked by the peculiar atrocity of the circumstances. Aged Mrs. Stockslager, living in a small cottage at the extreme northern end of 33rd Avenue, in those days a region sparsely settled and visited chiefly by picnickers bound for Baker's Beach, was found one Sunday morning literally hacked to pieces. From the location of portions of the dismembered body, it was apparent that the author had planned to carry the evidences of the crime away and sink them in the waters of the ocean, which tumbled and rolled on the rocks at the base of the steep cliff that marked the extremity of 33rd Avenue. A potato sack with the torso was found near the rear door to the cottage, indicating that whoever had committed the deed had probably been interrupted while carrying the remains to the bay, and had then fled. A kitchen butcher knife was the weapon used. Robbery was evidently the motive, for the hut had been ransacked thoroughly, such poor and mean trinkets as the recluse was known to possess having been taken." Mrs. Stockslager did a small business in sandwiches, popcorn, and soda water with the picnickers. The rumors of a miser's hoard that usually attached to such as she had long been current, but whether the slayer or slayers realized a profit in money could not be determined, as there was no one who could be found sufficiently familiar with her life to say whether she did or did not have a store of money on the premises." Such were the general facts which Sampson, city editor of the Inquirer, skeletonized tersely to Lanigan as that police reporter of superior talents reported for duty after a lapse of more than ordinary duration. "'Hop to it, Jack,' added Sampson. "'You've had your salary for two weeks. Show your appreciation.' Those were the days before automobiles might be requisitioned, uh, occasionally, for big assignments, and Lanigan, taking the steam line that in those days twisted around the ocean shore, was considerably later than the coroner's deputies, who had already discharged their functions, and now were engaged in making an impromptu meal upon the old woman's supply of sandwiches, the only loot available." Phillips and Castle, special duty men from the Golden Gate Park police station, were also on the scene. The upper office at headquarters is recruited, where it is not recruited by politics or favoritism, by these active young officers on special duty at the outside stations, and Lanigan knew that this particular brace of plainclothesmen were hard-working and ambitious, and without the strings that many times bring the ablest of upper office men a trifle too considerately into touch with the outlaw clans. "'What do you make of it, Phillips?' asked Lanigan, as the officer placed his notebook in his pocket. "'Wouldn't call it a suicide, exactly,' replied Phillips offishly. Lanigan laughed. "'No,' he drawled. "'I wouldn't put it past you to call it natural causes, though.' Phillips flushed to the base of his thick neck, but held himself from answering. He knew Lanigan by reputation, and did not care to match wits with him. Lanigan worked with most of the upper office men on intimate terms, but found it occasionally necessary to put a crimp in the arrogance or ignorance of the outside station officers, who do not come into contact with newspaper men as frequently as the downtown men, and at times elect to affect the same impartiality with which they treat ordinary persons. Such Lanigan took pride in bringing to a proper appreciation of the honorable place occupied by the brothers of the tribe. Lanigan ignored the two detectives and gave his attention to the coroner's deputies, the cottage and outskirts, and the contents of the wicker basket. Before the next train arrived, bringing a dozen reporters and cameramen from the other papers, and myself, Lanigan had finished his investigations. I found him seated on a salt-grass hummock, smoking and gazing absently up and down the rugged, rocky shoreline. The surf was tumbling heavily, although a few hundred yards out the sea was an undulating swell of greenish beauty. "'Some fine day,' was his greeting. "'Let's take a stroll down.' We made our way down the cliff to the rocks at the water's edge. 
imagination is oftentimes a great thing in solving crime he remarked as he poised himself perilously on a slippery rock and relit his cigar that and the take a chance instinct call it a hunch bull luck accident or as one great french detective said le grand hasard beautiful picture is it not he pointed toward the heads where a pacific mail steamship was just putting her pilot down the side she made a fine picture in truth with her clean lithe lines and her smoke blowing back like the wind-blown tresses of a girl we strolled along the intermittent stretches of sandy beach or clambered over the rocks and it finally struck me that lanagan's ferret eyes were not at all absent-minded or entirely busied with the natural beauties of the scene but that he was examining closely every square inch of the ground we travelled and the waters as we passed phillips is rather cagey he remarked he'll have to be taught his place he's a good officer though and leslie has his eye on him we must look out for that chap he not only has good legs a prime requisite of a detective or a reporter but he has a head that really works once in a while he sat down finally under the shelter of a great rock and motioned me to do likewise then he pulled from his pocket carefully tucked away a v-shaped piece of paper written over with chinese characters the corner that made the apex of the v was crinkled what do you make of it it's a piece of a chinese newspaper i replied really you could do credit to phillips examine it this time i tried again but could make nothing of it look he uncrumpled the slight crinkling at the apex and a tiny bit of red paper was exposed i was ashamed of my own lack of observation but just as puzzled as before and said so i should say said lanagan that this paper with the chinese characters was a piece of wrapping paper that someone tore it from a package with his fingernails and that a portion of the red wrapper of the package itself came off in his fingernails see he crumpled it up and sure enough it fitted neatly into the space under his fingernail well i asked vaguely then i had an inspiration the chinese burial ground was only an eighth of a mile away lanagan obviously had some theory connecting chinese with the crime the bit of paper evidently having dropped from a chinaman's blouse i told him so he laughed immoderately but indulgently and carefully put the bit of paper away in his pocket you're a stemwinder when it comes to writing fancy leads for my police stories he said still chuckling but i guess i'll have to give up for keeps trying to make a detective out of you i have shown you in perspective as it were during the past twenty minutes the solution of this entire crime if my theory is not altogether wrong and you can't see it let's get busy your legs can at least be of service to me i want you to stick around here for a couple of hours tackle everybody in sight for a knowledge of mrs stockslager how long she has been out here her past who her family are if any who her visitors have been if she had any particular idiosyncrasies or hobbies take in all the houses within a radius of a mile there are only four or five and try to get some kind of a line on her don't overlook the small boy in out-of-the-way regions like this he is the pioneer of civilization and you may tumble on to more through some roving urchin than all the grown-ups in the county i will leave instructions at the office where to meet me later i anticipate lively entertainment ahead when we got back to the cottage the coroner's deputies had gone as had phillips and castle cameramen were taking the house from many angles artists were busy sketching the interior that was the heyday of yellow journalism marking the spot with the old familiar cross reporters were still cluttered around a crowd of morbid persons attracted out of the very sky like vultures were already gathered suppose you've already got it all cleared remarked bradley of the times to lanagan he was lanagan's nearest approach to a rival as a police reporter clear as print can make it replied lanagan as he turned for the train he ran for the car leaving bradley secretly uneasy he had a wholesome regard for lanagan and knew that he was of few words and not given to wasting them 
i slipped the rest of the newspaper men and tramped the sand hills covering all of the houses buzzing an occasional small boy the best i could get for two hours hard work and the first tip came from an unwashed sling-shooting young american was a vague story that no one could substantiate that mrs stockslager had a worthless son who infrequently visited her for money i hugged this information close until i could see lanagan it so happened he ordered me to keep it quiet for that day giving no reasons i was chagrined the next morning to awaken and find that bradley had the same piece of information and had flashed it on the front page for an exclusive double-leaded feature to his story the search then turned to the sun he could be traced to within six or seven months of the murder i had to lumber along as best i could in handling the story without lanagan's assistance the stories in all the newspapers became monotonously uniform on the third day the interest was thinning there had not been a single new fact discovered nor so far as the inquirer was concerned had there been a word from lanagan he must have something sampson said to me irritably on the third day but take a flyer through his hangouts on the chance that he might have gone off again i shook my head that isn't lanagan with a story on i said he does his drinking when the story is turned in nevertheless i took a quick skirmish to connor's fogarty's and red murphy's and looked up kid monahan and some of lanagan's intimates in the upper office i could find no trace of him toward evening i dropped back to the inquirer after a final round-up of the ends of the story at police headquarters and there lanagan sat with his heels on sampson's desk with that pulseless individual shooting questions at him with the speed and precision of an automatic revolver i've given you all that i am free to give just now said lanagan shutting down on the questioning you've got a good enough scoop to hold the story for to-morrow let me handle the rest in my own way will you he was nettled don't be so didactic do you think i've been spending the last three days with a dry nurse he was the only man on the inquirer who could take that tone with sampson and hold his job no i know you've been on your toes hard jack and i appreciate it only the news call gets the best of me and this story has us all on edge replied sampson you're not to go near the prison continued lanagan i need norton to-night let martin write the story from here stockslager is absolutely out of it he has been a trustee at the city prison for about six months which clears him up name he goes under is swede stockley the police have known it all along but they have kept it dark for certain reasons which i am not at liberty now to state lend me that nice new mackintosh of your sampson it's raining like blazes and the enthusiastic mr norton and myself will have a hard stand to-night take your raincoat norton we are going out looking for ghosts around the stockslager cottage there's a real ghost of the old lady out there and i've wanted for a long time to have a run-in with a genuine spook she was seen on the cliff last night as the train stopped mccluskey the conductor thought he heard a sort of moaning he's a pretty nervy chap and the moans uh, coming it seemed from the hut didn't scare him much he walked over that way and silhouetted at the edge of the cliff he swears he saw the old lady herself it was too much even for mccluskey and he ran back to the train he and the engineer roberts went back with a couple of crowbars although he didn't say what good crowbars would do in tackling a bona fide ghost they just got one glimpse of the thing and it disappeared and they both swear it couldn't have had time to get any place before they reached the scene it was a fairly clear night during a break in the storm and they wasted five minutes and then went back to their train i was out there to-day and mccluskey told me the yarn they've kept it quiet around the car barn for fear of being ridiculed i have them pledged to secrecy don't use that angle of the story to-morrow though as i want to do some ghost hunting before the whole town hears about it and flocks out there come on norrie got your gun that ghost talk gave me all sorts of forebodings with a black night ahead and a driving rain ghost hunting on the scene of the murder in an environment sufficiently forbidding on a wintry night in any event failed to stir me to any particular height of enthusiasm 
fire ahead said samson with one of his mirthless grins but he was sitting comfortably in a steam-heated office it was nine o'clock when we boarded the steam cars at the old central avenue terminal mccluskey was a solid-jawed sensible self-reliant looking chap it puzzled me a sober steady man like that must have seen something very convincing before sponsoring talk of ghosts ghost hunting he asked yes replied lanagan good feature story this ghost stuff keep it quiet for a day or two longer will you sure i'll be on the watch for the inquirer to see about it looked for it tonight, but didn't see it he slowed down for us about an eighth of a mile from the thirty-third avenue stop and we dropped off into a bitter rain that rain would have quenched the tail fires of hell we struggled on heads down there was no use in trying to talk and i knew lanagan would take his own time about giving me any information we suddenly pulled stiffly up against two bulky rain-coated figures a dark lantern flashed first in my face and then in lanagan's well well it was lanagan's ready voice pitched a trifle high on account of the beating rain if it isn't messrs phillips and castle walking to reduce weight i presume what are you fellows doing out here asked philip gruffly well philip seeing that it's you i'll tell you it's none of your business maybe we're going to swim to the phalarones do you understand me perfectly isn't it we'll see and i don't know whether we want you snuffing around here or not replied phillips he was a choleric man was phillips with a neck too thick even for a policeman i thought for a moment lanagan would have us both ordered back but he only laughed in that mocking machiavellian laugh of his that could rasp like a file on a sore tooth dear me he said your mood fits the weather phillips very disagreeable i am not concerned with your wants i am going to snuff to my heart's content now please step off the right away and permit us to pass we are both citizens of this great and glorious city that overpays you most disgracefully in proportion to your attainments and as such citizens our powers and privileges on the county domain are precisely as full and complete as yours phillips you'll never do no policeman ever succeeds who begins by antagonizing newspaper men i'm telling you you won't do step aside please we want to go on and we don't purpose to walk around you to do it for a moment things looked ugly with phillips standing fast castle took him by the arm come on tom you're wrong he said and the two officers stepped to one side and we passed on with lanagan chuckling aloud ghost hunting is becoming a regular fad he said finally and i shouldn't be surprised to find a few more hunters scattered around we will let phillips and castle pass we stepped quickly to one side and sank down behind a hillock of very wet and very cold sand lanagan was correct the two detectives had turned and followed us they went on ahead having missed us it was shivery here were four men two trailing two others who assumed they were the trailers and all bound for a murder house on a black night to hunt ghosts for it was safe to assume that in some fashion phillips and castle had heard the ghost episode did we but know it at the time we were in turn being trailed by two keen-eyed storm-coated men each of whom kept a steady hand in his overcoat pocket for as phillips and castle disappeared on ahead and we were just stepping back to the railroad tracks from our place of concealment lanagan suddenly bore back and stopped i followed suit more ghost hunters he whispered in my ear pointing two blurred indistinct figures passed along the right-of-way it was awesome but lanagan gave me no time for questions stooping low threshing softly through the dripping salt grass in and out among the sand dunes we worked our way gradually toward the cliffs along the ocean the coat fairly well protected my body but my shoes were soaked and i was drenched with the cold numbing rain to my knees in a position i should judge about twenty yards from the point where the path from the stockslagger's path led over the cliff to the rocks below we crouched against a hummock the ocean roared beneath us and the white froth of the breakers tumbling on the rocks could be faintly seen each time it would flash into the corner of my eye i thought it was a ghost time i don't believe in ghosts of course 
but under such circumstances one can't help wondering a little bit from behind us as we lay there once twice thrice four times we heard the toot toot of the train and i knew that we had lain there for two mortal hours because the train made hourly round trips i thought of samson and his snug office and his snug salary and i compared myself taking the chances of anything from a pistol ball to pneumonia for my thirty dollars a week i concluded to quit the business at the end of this scrape but i always determined to do that under such circumstances so does every newspaper man and they always show up for work the next day were we not at least potential paranoiacs we wouldn't be newspaper men certainly otherwise we wouldn't do the things we do for the pay we get regarding newspaper photographers there is no question they are all crazy well, except one we had drunk the last drop from the healthy flask apiece we had brought and i was settling back in soggy misery for more suffering my eyes so blurred with watching and staring that i could see slinking forms in fancy every place i turned when lanagan's lean hand clutched my leg he had taken a position lower and nearer the path than i and could get a dim perspective of the edge of the cliff just where the path descended i peered ahead faintly i could see a single figure outlined in blurred relief and then it disappeared apparently into thin air whether it was man or woman i could not have told that it disappeared before my eyes i knew it gave one a creepy feeling i was about to speak to lanagan but his warning pressure was still on my calf probably thirty minutes passed or it may have been only three another figure came into view and then another and disappeared then i realized that the first figure had simply slipped down the path and out of sight i wondered if something of the sort hadn't happened when mccluskey was ghost hunting still and again held that vice-like clutch on me another prolonged interval two more figures bulked into view and disappeared many more minutes passed and lanagan said no word the wind during the hours had died away but the rain continued pelting now straight down lanagan's hand finally loosened itself from my leg he pointed over the ocean toward the intermittent flashes of the lighthouse at land's end between the land's end and fort point lights could be seen the lights of a vessel she's a day overdue on account of the storm lanagan shot up at me she's heading through the golden gate now we'll have some fun shortly i reckon he straightened up and stretched himself, and I did likewise, threshing my arms to start the blood into circulation. I was cold, cramped, and grouchy. Jack, I said impatiently, cut out this mystery stuff and give me the facts. You've got me neck and neck with pneumonia now. Kick through with this story, whatever it is, or I'm going to tear down that cliff after those fellows and start something, if only to keep warm. Of course, he only laughed. The man must have been made of chilled steel. Easy, Norrie. Think of the ten cents car fare you can charge up on this assignment. That ought to be some compensation, that and the glory of the thing, even if you do get sciatica or lumbago or some other old woman's complaint. Norrie, sometimes you make me weary. Here I'm staging one of the finest climaxes you have ever participated in. I have adopted a true Shakespearean method of suiting the natural surroundings to the action. It's rather an epic situation, in my opinion. Now that liner, it was the mailboat Hong Kong, has finally passed inside the gate. Any minute something may happen, and I pick you out of the entire staff to be here when it does happen here in an elemental atmosphere where human lives may be snuffed out as we snuffed out the contents of those flasks and still you're not satisfied it's a big vital gripping situation where's your imagination oh hell you're drunk let's chase down after those men let's do something to start things whatever they may be i'm cold lanagan was genuinely put out with me later i knew why he had been hanging around these bleak cliffs for two nights and skulking in the sand dunes for two days watching the stockslager hut no wonder i was a quitter by comparison he whirled on me and i saw his eyes flashing with that curious light that i had seen in them on rare occasions when he was thoroughly aroused 
You either quit whining or beat it back to town. If he had struck me in the face, it couldn't have affected me differently. Such was the magnetism of that remarkable man. I beg your pardon, Jack. I didn't mean to rough you, I said. And he was his natural self in a moment, too. All right, forget it. Let's take a peek over the cliff. We crawled to the edge of the path. Lanigan was ahead. He was on his feet with a leap the instant he struck the ledge, and I up beside him. Ha! he shouted. They're at it. Now we'll see. Now we'll see. Le grand hassad. Far down below I saw a half a dozen flares in the darkness, smattered, smeared flares of yellowish light, and then all was blackness again. There came no report from weapons, the roaring of the surf drowning that. More by instinct than anything else, to be on the scene of action, I made a quick step toward the path. Lanigan's hand was on my arm. Wait, he said curtly. This is no funeral of ours. Wait. He knelt down, arching his hands around his eyes and peering long and intently. Revenue officers, he said. We can't monkey with them. Haven't got them in my staff like Leslie and his men. They'll be up. Revenue officers? A light began to dawn upon me. The toot-toot of the engine came. Beat it, Norrie. Hold that train, ordered Lanigan. There may be some wounded here to rush to town. Quick. I was already off on the run past the Stockslager hut to the little platform where the train stopped. It was some distance away around the curve. As I stood there with the rain pattering a monotonous tattoo on the planking, there came a sudden groan, a drawn-out rasping groan, and I whirled toward the house, my body one quiver of goose flesh. It came again from up toward the roof, and as it came there was a breathing of light wind across my face. I laughed aloud, but nervously. Another light puff of wind, another long-drawn groan. Loose shingles or a loose piece of clapboarding, giving, evidently, just the slightest against a nail. The other end of the ghost mystery was cleared. The train pulled in. I told McCluskey there had been a shooting and to hold the train. Can't back her in. We'll run out to the first switch, he cried, as he jumped into the cab with the engineer. I ran back to find four men bearing a form between them. Lanigan was alongside the leader of the four, talking swiftly. They kicked in the door of the hut and made a light. On the floor, littered just as it had been littered the Sunday morning of the murder discovery, they placed the figure they bore, a stalwart figure of a man. A leg and an arm, I could see, were useless. They felt of his arm and leg, and he never winced, staring straight at the ceiling. They ripped away his oilskin coat, his overshirt and undershirt. He had a bullet just over the heart, a deep wound, and one that bled inwardly, for no blood oozed out. Two of the four men had deposited on the floor bulky bundles wrapped in rubber, around which double pairs of life preservers were strapped. He who seemed to be the leader of the four, Marshall, a chief revenue inspector, Lanigan whispered to me, took the man's pulse after the examination was ended. No one had spoken. In the faces of all, as far as I could detect in the murky light of the smoky chimney of an oil lamp, was a set, grim look. Not the look that officers usually wear when there has been a killing or a successful capture on a crime. Marshall straightened up. He said solemnly, "'Billy, I think you are going. What have you got to say? Any message?' "'No, Jim,' said the man on the floor weakly. "'You got me right. I went into the thing with my eyes open. Only don't ask me to squeal on the others. I got what I deserved, I guess. I've brought shame to the service, and I'm ready to pass. Thank God, thank God,' he burst out with sudden choking. "'The wife is not here. Passed out last year, you know, and there never were any kiddies.' no one to suffer but you boys that i've disgraced a tear rolled from his eyes to the floor can i say a word to him marshal it was lanigan who spoke the other men had bowed their heads on one or two faces i could see a tear for all the wetness that the rain had left there in right said lanigan kneeling down beside the stricken man you know you are passing make a clean breast who killed mrs stocklager his eyes closed, and he seemed to shrink, as though trying to hug the floor he was lying upon. "'Whiskey!' came Lanigan's sharp whisper. 
unconsciously he was taking command of the situation asserting his natural leadership as he always did in tense moments marshall passed him a pocket flask and he forced a sip to enright's lips holding his head up with his left arm the eyes opened i did oh god billy no no not that not that it was marshall he broke down and sobbed like a boy Twenty-five years he had been in the Federal Blue with Billy Enright, one in the Revenue, the other in the Customs Service. Yes, I did. Jim, get me a priest. Don't let me die like this. For old time's sake, Jim. The train was whistling on its return. We're taking you right in, said Lanigan smoothly. We'll have a priest for you. Why did you kill her? Enright motioned for the flask with his free arm. Lanigan gave him a long pull. For a time, at least, his voice was stronger. She was threatening to tip off the gang. She used to work with us. She was well paid. She didn't know I was in the service. She found it out some way. I came out one day to talk over with her about her threats. I'd been drinking, worrying, over fear of exposure. She wouldn't listen to reason. She was a wolf. She goaded me crazy, I guess. She taunted me about being a traitor to the country I served. Well, I lost my head. I grabbed the butcher knife and killed her. So help me, God, as I am about to die. That's the truth. The eyes closed for a space, and then he continued. I stuck a few things in my pockets to make it look like robbery. Then I started to cut up the body to pack it in a sack and bury it or drop it over the cliff. I weakened and dropped it outside the door and ran. It was dark, but I ran for miles around over the sand hills, and it seemed she was always right after me. It was awful. I got my wits back later. I saw the police and the papers were after the sun. I felt easier. There was a big shipment coming in on the Hong Kong, forty thousand dollars all told. No one would come out here and take a chance landing it. Afraid the police were watching the house. I volunteered. I figured if anyone saw me nosing around, I could give them the inspector talk. I hung around last night, but the ship was held away out on account of the storm. I had to come out again, tonight. That's all, boys. The door flung open, and through it came Phillips and Castle. McCluskey and Roberts followed. The train had stopped unnoticed, so tense was the interest within the hut in the dying man's recital. Quick, take him up, said Lanigan. They stooped to lift him. Here, what's all this? It was Phillips. Stand aside, came Marshall's blunt command. It was obeyed. Enright's eyes had closed. He was made as comfortable as possible with cushions on the train, as that ancient rattle-trap strained and tugged to make the greatest speed of its history. Enright's eyes did not open on the trip in. They never opened again. Lanigan filled in for me the details of the story. The bit of red paper, crinkled inside the paper with the Chinese characters, meant but one thing, opium. Here was where his wide acquaintance with the underworld and Chinatown, the custom service, and the waterfront aided him. Puzzling over the presence of an opium wrapping in that isolated hut, Lanigan had seated himself upon the salt-grass hummock to smoke. Into his field of vision steamed the Pacific Mail liner, and his hunch came with it. His examination of the shore followed to locate a cove that would give a safe place to float the opium to land from a launch or Whitehall boat by day or night. Such a cove he had found, where the waters, for a sixteenth of a mile, deposited their driftwood. His theory was complete. The hut was a smuggler's runway. The woman was in the ring, and for a breach of faith had been slain, an attempt being made to have it appear she was slain by robbers. That Marshall and his men had been preparing to close in on the gang that made the cabin their rendezvous, Lanigan did not know until the night before. Then I found the whole map out here sprinkled with them, recognized Marshall, who nearly stumbled over me, but he probably figured I was one of his men and said nothing. It was funny, McCluskey and Roberts chasing ghosts with myself and four revenue officers as the audience. I nearly laughed when McCluskey told me the story this morning. They didn't come within fifteen yards of the edge of the cliff, either, although they said they did. 
the weatherman told me today the storm would blow over by evening and i figured the hong kong would be making port and the ring would attempt to land their stuff every liner has been bringing it in i came out last night on the chance she might try to make port no one suspected enright it was a quarter to one o'clock when the train pulled into the depot marshall turned the body over to phillips and castle with a terse resume of the facts and then took his men and his bundles of opium and disappeared they laid enright out on a bench to await the coroner's deputies phillips came over to us i guess i act a kind of stiff he said in awkward apology but i want to hand it to you you scored on us strong lanagan put out his hand the detective took it you'll never make any mistake treating newspaper men right phillips just do this much for us now will you hold off thirty minutes before you telephone the morgue that will keep the story exclusively for the inquirer i'll do it said phillips and he did which may seem to the layman a little thing but to the newspaper man a detail of vast importance because it enabled lanagan sending the story to the office by telephone to score once again in sensational manner over his contemporaries the times and the herald end of out of the depths <laughs>